journal. It's not like a man wrote his, a bunch of songs down, but it's the it's the it's it's like this broken man. In the last few weeks, months or so, we've talked with this situation where there was a boy by the name of Samuel who anointed a king named David, a young boy, who later became the king after Saul died and his son Jonathan. We went through this whole story. We talked about uh, betrayal. We talked about bitterness. We talked about forgiveness. But to me, as a, as a dad, I, I have an imagination. You all do. And your imagination can take you into your future, into certain places. A vision is one thing for me to see maybe where we're going. But an imagination, maybe even left a little unchecked, a dream. Many of you have had dreams about how you thought life was going to be and how you thought it would turn out. And then war would break out. Or there would be a division in your home life. Or maybe financial uh, problems would take place. In my life, I see King David as a man who looked like, you know, I, I killed a giant. I'm working for King Saul. Things are working out good. I've married Michael, his daughter. Uh, now I'm, I'm moving forward in life. Now maybe Saul's dead and I'm the king, but I've got sons to carry on. And then Amnon gets murdered by Absalom because he did a very treacherous thing to his sister uh, Tamar. And now Absalom is, is chasing after David. And, and so here's a man that had a, I remember when I first got born again, I saw this sign, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I really didn't know what it meant because back in the day there were kings everywhere. There were kings. Uh, lands had kings, but he's king of kings. But when you're in America, we don't think of kings. We, we vote people in, vote them out, and things of that nature. But in other countries, kings stay until their death or they're assassinated. So, but this man will never be assassinated. He'll never be dethroned. He'll never be removed. He'll always be king of kings. And David, as a boy, served this king of and loved him. And he wrote in his journal, Psalm chapter 3, verse 1, Lord, he's, he's addressing the Father, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that, that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Amen. There is no help for him. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. As I, and I'm just going to walk a little here, and y'all just move that uh, thing up. But this is what I see. I see a man who is so broken and so saddened in all of his dreams and what he believed would happen, that he, one of his sons would take his place. Now that son is rose up against him and is trying to uh, thwart and take over the kingdom. David goes off and he pens this journal, uh, Lord how are they increase that trouble me? Many there be which say in my soul, there is no help for him in God. I've had people say that of me. Probably you've said it, people have said it of you. But I know that, Lord, you are the glory and the lifter. There's no greater moment than when a father can take the chin of his son and lift his head and look him right in the eyes and let him know that everything's going to be all right. And when David said, he's the glory and the lifter of my head, his head was down. He was saddened. He, tragedy had overcome him. Everything that he believed was going to happen in life was gone. And it was as if the, the one he served grabbed hold of his chin with his index finger and lifted his head up and looked him in the eye and said, everything's going to be all right, David. Everything's going to be fine. I'm the glory. When I read Psalm 3, and I've read Psalm 3, I've, I've sang Psalm 3, I've shouted Psalm 3. Psalm 3 has been one of my favorite psalms because of this moment that David is fleeing from Absalom, and he writes it down. You are the glory and the lifter of my. There's times, ain't nobody else can lift your head. There are times, ain't nobody going to help you. They're not going to come to your rescue. And you're going to have to look at the Father and say, Dad, would you lift my head up? Would you remind me? Would you look me in the eye and tell me everything's going to be all right? Later he wrote in Psalm 42, as the deer, many of you have heard this, and we've got beautiful deer right now running around the property. Gorgeous deer. Bucks coming out. My wife looked at me the other day. She said, look, our freezer's full. Don't you even think about it. And I said, you ain't the boss of me. <laughs> as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. Then David goes on. Keep rolling. 
My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with him? It's like a journal. He's writing it down. My tears have been my food day and night. I have wept and wept till I couldn't weep no more. While men say to me all day long, where is your God? You remember, we'll go back to Psalm 3, the glory and the lift from my head. Amen. He says, where is your God? These things I remember. I remember I poured out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God. Amen. To hear Justin Gambino sing with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. I remember what church was like. I remember the joys I once had. I remember how things were so good back then. And then he goes on to say, why are you downcast? Why are you saddened? Why are you negative? Amen, oh, my soul. Why so disturbed within me? Something's happening in here I don't understand. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from the mount. I'm going to remind myself of the goodness of God in the land of the living. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go back? See, some of you, bless your heart, you're so positive all the time. God's never heard you speak a negative word because you're afraid that if you do that everything's going to go chaotic. And God said, listen, I'm big enough God to listen to any of your disputes, any of your complaints. I've heard you whining. You might as well whine to me. Amen. Tell me how you really feel. Why have you forgotten me? I must go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy. My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where's your God? Huh. That was said to me once. Where is your God now? Why are you downcast on my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. David had been knocked down, but he hadn't been knocked out. You know, reality is knowing that life has not turned out the way we planned. We've been wounded. We have scars. That display is the authenticity of life. I've pastored large churches, small churches. I have been in the midst of mighty Men of God who laid hands on me and asked God to multiply and to do it again. I've been prophesied over by some of the best. In my mind, I had an imagination of dreams, what they were going to be like. It didn't happen the way I thought. Neither is it for you. All our dreams will not come to pass as we thought. We're human, and he knows that full well. Life didn't turn out like David thought it would either. I'm sure he dreamed of one of his sons taking his place. There are days we wake up and we realize... Marriages aren't going to work out. There are days when we realize the company we've worked for all these years is not going to make it. Bankruptcy. Such a dream. But now there are children that have come to the realization no matter how much they pray, their parents are not going to get back together. And they'll have to manage their lives between two households. Pastor, why? Why you talk like this? Because this is reality. This is where we live. It's not the dreams that we tried to create and make happen. We've prayed friends not die of cancer only to sit by them at the hospital as they pass from this life. I've held their hands. To be told that your best friend has leukemia and his ministry looks like it's going to be cut short. Being on the edge of bitterness toward God as we accept the fact that life doesn't always turn out as we thought it should. There are times after 31 years of pastoring, I would be further along than I am right now that I wouldn't look out and even see empty pews. Hmm. Dreams seem to be broken. God takes the bitter, and he takes the herbs, and he takes a Passover moment, and he mixes them together, and he says to us, life is going to have its bitter moments, but learn to eat a whole lot of lamb. And if you can get a whole lot of Jesus, you can handle a little bit of bitter. But everybody's going to go through some bitter moments. Everybody's going to have some dreams that are going to be broken. Things are going to be cut a little shorter than you thought. There are times when champions face life, even the ugliest of life. You know, I'm a sports nut, and I love to watch a, a champion, amen, as they assemble up to the heights. But almost inevitably, no matter how high they reach, they're going to fall. 
They come back down and they score less. They don't do as much. Something happens here. Things break down. And have you a time when you said, I didn't want it that way, but, you know, but asking God, help me. None of this makes sense. You're frustrated, maybe not even understanding the will of God. That's what David's doing here in Psalm 42 is he says, as the deer pants. Amen. I'm struggling with life here. I had different dreams. How, how, now, how, how did all this happen? In the midst of it, he cries out, there has to be a road back from this dream. Faith wasn't created for the perfect day, but for when life is difficult. I've often said, I ain't going to need faith in heaven. I won't need mercy in heaven. I won't need grace in heaven. That's good for earth. Can I get an amen? amen? But here, here, faith wasn't created for the perfect day. It was created when things get rough. Amen. And I got to believe God for something to change. David's life begins as this youngest boy of eight, being illegitimate. He wasn't there. He wasn't born in the lineage of kings, but won the spiritual lottery. Amen. Anointed king as a teen. Shows up at the battle of the ages carrying cheese. No armor bearer for this young king. No entourage. No shield. No sword. Just cheese. Just a five stones and a sling. And then bingo. He won the lottery again. Giant slayer. National hero. Then King Saul sets up to marry the king's daughter. And he becomes the best friend with the king's son. Bingo again. Man, this guy can't lose. He was taking care of the sheep, cleaning out stalls, son, signing songs, singing songs in solitude. Then bingo. We have a tendency to think that life ain't never going to stop. It's just going to keep on getting better. It's just going to keep right on rocking. Amen. In the next few weeks, I'll have a motorcycle delivered to me. I won a lottery. I think they call it a raffle. I only did it just to help a guy out financially, and I won. Oh, God, what will I do with another motorcycle? I don't know. Quit. Yeah, I'm going to ride it. <laughs> but we have a tendency when we start thinking that everything's happening. It's just rolling and rolling. It's all good. But then a few poor choices. He does great as a king. Oh, what a warrior. What a man of God. But pitiful as a father. And over a course of time, he does for his children what his dad did to him. He let them raise themselves. And by doing so, it caused trouble. After some times, we've already understood what took place with Absalom as he set him up like a terrorist. He turns against the people. He turns against the king. Now, for the second time in his life, David is going to run for his life. First, from his employer, Saul, out of jealousy. Now, he runs from his son. He doesn't want to see his son destroyed. And here's the thing. When men go through problems, there are three things men basically do. And you can write this down pretty easy to remember. First, fight. Everybody say fight. As he did against the lion, as he did against the lion, a bear, as he did against Goliath, the enemies of Israel. But you can't fight every problem, sir. Every problem can't be fought. You can't fist fight. There's a time when you're young, you think, I can take on anything. And then you get older and find out that a doggone fall from a lawnmower almost put you in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you shouldn't laugh. I shouldn't either. <laughs> but we fight. We fight, and we believe God, we hold on. And then, and then sometimes when we fight, it can happen, but then we try to fix it. We just try to fix it. When someone shares with you, and you get good counsel, counsel is a powerful thing. If you can get around the right counsel, or somebody else has gone through something in life, and you ask him, how, how would you fix this situation in, in business or marriage or children? What would you do here? But, you know, so that's what happened. You begin to fix it. And then the third one you find among David's life, even though a great warrior, fleeing, running. He just ran. It's an enemy who he could not fight. I will not fight my son. We've been reading the tale of three kings. Uh, our staff has every morning when we meet. And we realize David did not want to fight against his son Absalom. And he just fled. And he journaled. And he wrote, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While men say to me all day long, where's your God? He felt forsaken. He felt forgotten. He realizes his son is not coming home. And so what does he do? He engages. Everybody say engage. You did that this morning. Some of you didn't even realize it. But as, as Justin was singing, you started engaging. It's been a while since you've done that. But you, you felt a connection with the presence of God. And there was an engaging took place. You begin to search for God. I, I got to find him. That's what David did. He began to search for God. It was like a, an, an APB put out for him. He had to find God. No matter what, he pressed in. You know, we're at our best when we're seeking for God, when we need him. Ever been to a place in your life 
when the difficulties in life drove you to seek him, when you didn't have the answer for it, the doctor didn't have the answer, other people didn't have, so you got to go after God. He, you stay more focused than ever. Life didn't turn out as you thought. i got to find him who mends broken dreams. He fixes potholes. Life now has new meaning. Searching has benefits. Luke chapter 15 tells us of a search for a, a lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost child. Amen, the prodigal son. Amen. But, but here, a, 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 a coin. A valuable coin. If I was to get into your homes, almost all of you have something valuable in your house. What's wild is some of you forgot where you put it. But it's there. And in my home, we've gone through two major floods. And every time it floods in my house, I find old stuff again. Because I forgot where I put it. Some of you are wealthy and you don't even know it. Because you forgot where you put the money. But it's there. So what do you do? You turn a light on. She searched for a coin. She searched for something valuable. When something's valuable to you, you get a light on it. You start searching for it. You go after it. One reason that God hasn't done a lot in your life is he, He's not valuable to you anymore. It's just going through emotion. It's, it's just uh, every Sunday I do this, and then I go home, and then I got to believe. But God is a God worth seeking. He's a glory. He's the lifter of your head. He's the same powerful anointing in Psalm 3 and Psalm 42 for a man, David, as he is for you. When I seek after God, I become a worshiper. The English word is to give value to. To worship is an English word, worship. Sometimes people come by our place and they say, Pastor, your old car, uh, your old 71 Challenger is dusty. Yeah, it's dusty. Your motorcycles are, are dusty. Yeah, they are, because I don't worship them. I don't worship these vehicles. They're hooks. People show up out at the ranch, I fire them off. And immediately I got their attention. It's like people love stuff. Don't we? You know, we just love stuff. But, but I don't worship it. I, I appreciate it. I'll drive it. I'll ride it. But I'm not gonna, it's not going to ever be an idol to me. But him, him, amen, to seek after him, to give worth, ship to him. See, I, some of us were brought up in church, and I wasn't brought up in church, which was such a blessing to me. And I'm glad many of you were here. But here's the thing. When, I, when you worship, it's not about being Pentecostal. It's not about being charismatic. It's not about being a Baptist. You know, worship is something that's inside of every one of us. It's an outward expression of an inward love. And when you love him, you have to express yourself. When you love something or someone, you express. I love my grandkids. You know, I do. And, and I look at him. Meh. But I've loved this kid since he was a baby boy. And all he's done is mow grass, weed eat it, cut limbs. Papa, what do you need? And you know what I'm starting to pick up on? This kid loves me because he's focused on me. He picks me up. He helps me get up now. Which <laughs> You hear what I'm saying? Amen. He, he, he brought my bag out to the truck today. There's, when, when, when your kids start following, people start loving you. There, there's a, now, again, we're not to be worshipped. We understand that. But to be appreciated, to be loved. And when, when I seek, I become a worshiper. you got to hear me. It's not just looking for the kingdom, but I'm looking for the king. I'm not looking to be healing. I'm looking for the healer. I'm not looking just for the blessing. I'm looking for the blesser. Amen. And you got to seek God. And there's a quiet side to God. David used several phrases about God hiding himself. And, and it, it, it looks crazy. But well, when you search for God, it's an act of worship. We only search for what we value. You only search for what you value. Amen. So if you value something, you search after it. You, you go looking for it. There's things in your home, if it flooded or if it burned, you wouldn't even care about it. But there's certain things have value to you. When worship expresses the, wor the worth of an object, so how much worth is God? Oh, unlimited. Hear it. When the desire is strong and the need is great, we overcome our inabilities and we press our way into his presence. We say, God, we got to have you. Searching in the darkness sharpens our senses as we exercise areas that we wouldn't normally need. As I was on that tower, this uh, the other night, 11 o'clock at night. All of a sudden, my eyes, I went out to the tower early. I was first one there, got on top of the tower. And I stayed there till my eyes started focusing on light. And I started picking up on things that you think, and you couldn't see it. But if I stayed there long enough, the focus came in, 
and I could start picking up on what was out there in front of me. Many times in life, we don't focus long enough, so we never see God. Amen. But if we focus, amen, if we stay connected to it. Acts 17, verse 26 says, From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. He determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. You live here now because he said so. You live here now because he said so. So stop your whining. Oh, why, why am I in Southeast Texas? Why was I born when I was born? Because he said so. So embrace it. Enjoy it. You could have been stuck up north. Yankee. <laughs> but God put you in the greatest state in the union. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Look what he says here. I put you where I put you, and I had you born when you were born. Verse 27, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. In other words, God said, look, I don't know if you will. I don't know if you still reach, will reach out. I don't know if you will pray to me. I just lifted my hands during worship, Colton, which I have not done all week. Been able to lift my hand. There's a certain anointing. And I'm not trying to be a carnival showman here. But there's a certain anointing about sharing the Word of God and being in the presence of God that brings healing to your body. And I could sit in a waiting room, and I was in with that chiropractor yesterday, and he beat on me, and I couldn't lift my arm, and I couldn't stretch it out. And here I am, about this close to getting ready, feeling like I could play golf. <laughs> no, that I can worship him. We've all groped in the dark for the plan and the purpose of God. He put us in this place and this time so we'd seek him. And we may not talk about prayer a lot in this church, but praying and communicating with God is one of the most powerful resources and relationships you've got on this earth. Releasing, when I search, it releases answers. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be open. Amen. So important. When I seek God, it takes uh, Focus, Isaiah 59, 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he'll have mercy on him. And to our God and he will freely pardon. Seek the Lord while he's found. Isn't that funny? He, of course he's going to be found. He didn't disappear. But what of us as adults had not ever played hide and seek with our kids? Hid. I used to hide from my kids, uh, you know, and being out at the ranch, there's 110 acres to hide, and I know where every hiding spot is. And then kids would come out when my, when my kids were little, and I said, let's play, you know, hide and seek was the best thing I could do because it was the way I could get away from them. <laughs> and they'd start counting, I'd go hide. And there's a desperation about it because that child will start hunting for you, and they'll start seeking for you. And you'll see them, they can't see you. And God sees you, you can't see him. And you start seeking after him. And you think, well, surely he's in church on Sunday morning, but maybe he wasn't here this morning. Maybe you didn't sense him here this morning. But you start seeking after him through the day, and maybe Monday or Tuesday, by Wednesday, amen, you start really seeking after God. And it's like you hadn't found him. He sees you, you can't see him. And then in a moment of desperation, you start screaming out, Dad, Dad, where are you at? I want to tell you what he'll do. He'll come out from hiding. Because that's what daddies do. I can't stay. Once my kids get desperate that they've got to find me, I give up. I give up. Here I am. Hey, man, come on. Let's go get pizza. Hey, man, you found me. You got me. Hey, man, because that's what daddies do. Your mamas do. That's what your father does. You seek him, and eventually, I'm telling you, he will begin to find you. And when he does, he's going to put that finger under your chin, and he's going to lift your head. He's going to hold your head up, and he's going to take care of your enemies. Because that was David's prayer. He asked him, amen. He asked him the question, why am I here? Why are you downcast on my soul? Why so disturbed, disturbed with me? David was a, a keeper of sheep. He understood when sheep went cast. The word C-A-S-T, to cast down, to go down. Amen. When a sheep seeks the comfortable places, they go, their back goes back and their feet go up. 
kind of like my position this week. Because of the multiple stomachs they've got, the gases in their stomach will move up in their esophagus and it will suffocate them to death. We all look for easy places. We like easy chairs. We like lazy boy. We like comfortable vehicles. Amen. Everything about our lives is centered around comfort. We like air conditioning. We, just, we love easy life. We like to get in a vehicle, Sammy, where, the, where the, it don't go ding, ding, ding no more. Amen. We, we love just easy lives. <sighs> what causes, what, what's going to happen, it causes us to get cast down. Amen. Nothing motivated me quicker than getting hurt this week. Everything I did was pushing me toward getting well again. I have to get well. See, whenever you get cast, you start looking for low places, comfort. David did that. He got himself in trouble. Amen. When your wool becomes too heavy, when the sheep's wool becomes too heavy, they get sheared. He's called to be a producer. Come on up, Pastor Joseph. Amen. Called to be a, a producer, not a spectator. God called you to produce. Here's, here's one of our problems in life. We got too much stuff. You know, if you get too much stuff, you got to take care of it. A few years ago, I found myself looking at my insurance. And I insured five vehicles and two motorcycles. I'm one person. I had five vehicles and two motorcycles on insurance. Now, I was carrying a lot of other people's insurance, too. So I had to start kicking them out of the house. <laughs> and that brought my insurance down. Okay. And, and, then, and then I sold vehicles. Now I have a truck. Amen. So it's like overnight, I, I was getting blessed because I got too much stuff. If I can't admit it, so can you. Too much stuff. So what happens with a, with a sheep, they got wool on them. And they get too much wool, and that wool starts hanging, and it gets mangly. Amen. It gets manged up. And then all of a sudden, it gets near the water. When David said in Psalm 23, he talked about being near the stillness of water. Because that sheep gets scared, get in the water, the water soaks up his wool, and then he drowns. So when David talked about being cast, he's talking about us. We get depressed easy. We get, we get cast. We, 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 we sit down, and next thing you know, everything gets easy and nice and wonderful. And next thing we know, we look like a cockroach in a cheap motel in Texas. <laughs> Amen. Our feet are up, and our back is down, and we're stuck, and we can't get up. And there ain't nobody there. And Lassie can't go get help because Timmy's stuck in the well. Amen. And you're just laying there. And, and, and your pastor comes along. And you think I'm seeing you with all pretty face and makeup. And what I see is your legs up in the air like a cockroach in a cheap motel. Because you're cast. You're depressed. You're down. Your dreams didn't come true. Your kids didn't turn out the way you thought they would. Bankruptcy. Division. The death of a spouse, friend, or family member. You're down. When David said, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you in me? Put your hope in God. I'm going to praise him, my Savior, my God. Position yourself for God to help you. So this morning, you came here to position yourself for God to help you. I've been praying through the night. I don't know what else to do. You lay there and you can't sleep. You know what I'm talking about, sister? You lay there and you can't sleep. So I start praying. I pray for my grandson granddaughter I pray for my kids I pray for you I pray for myself I lay hands on myself amen I get all I do all that stuff that I've taught you to do I do it to myself because I can't sleep hope thou in God hope is the earnest expectation of something good he's for me my dreams may not come out the way I wanted them to but he's the glory look at it again oh Lord how many are my foes? Do you know you got enemies that are trying to addict you? You got enemies that are trying to cast you down? You got enemies 
that are trying to keep you so busy, busy, that you can't ever be effective anymore. you got so many enemies. That's what David is saying here. How many foes, how many rise up against me? I feel them coming against me. Many are saying, God's not going to deliver him. God's not going to help him. Lord, see, let me so pause and think about it. When I was a youth pastor, I had a Rottweiler named Sela. She was attack trained. If you kissed at my dog, she'd bite you. I trained her that way. So nobody could come up and make friends with my dog. I named her Sela, which means think about it. Before you pet her, think about it. Because she'd come up. But you are a shield around me. Devil can't get to my back, can't get to my side, can't get to my front. He's a shield around me. You bestow glory on me, and you lift my head. To the Lord I cry aloud, and he answers me from his holy hill. Selah. I lie down and I sleep. I woke up because the Lord sustains me. You go to bed at night. Don't go to bed in terror. Know that he's going to take care of you, sustain you. And if you don't wake up in this life, you wake up in that life. Last Sunday night, I got the message that my friend, Greg Pretty, been uh, such an encourager to so many in our church. He's such a funny guy. Sat down, mid-60s. His wife got him some sweet tea. He took a sip at 7 o'clock in his chair. She went back by 8 o'clock and touched him. And he'd gone on to be with Jesus. I said, Lord, I, I don't know how you want to get rid of me, but that'd be a pretty cool way to go to sit here and then you take me he sustained me I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side arise O Lord deliver me O my God strike all my enemies on the jaw break the teeth of the wicked from the Lord comes deliverance may your blessing be on your people God takes the bitter and the sweet he takes the rough and the smooth he puts it together. But can I tell you, I know most of you, and your dreams did not turn out the way you thought. The plans you had didn't turn out the way you thought. So you got to go to the journal, and you got to find yourself there. Sometimes you got to just say, just like David did, Lord, you're the glory and the lifter of my head. I'm not going to fear if 10,000 are around me. You, I went to sleep, and you sustained me. You looked after me. And learned to give God glory. Amen. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Faith, faith, faith. Faith wasn't created for the perfect day, but for when life becomes difficult for you. I can't keep my grandkids or my kids or my friends from all the things they're going through in life. Sometimes roads are broken. Sometimes there are potholes. But I'm going to say this to you again. He's the glory and the lifter don't go through life with your head down. You're the saint of God. You're his child. Lift your head. Father, in Jesus' name. Could I ask you to do, do something? Maybe it's a little bit symbolic. But to hold your hands out in a cup fashion. And within your hands, you're giving him your dreams. God, these broken dreams, broken promises. Life didn't turn out like I thought it would. When I got married, I thought it would be this way. When I had kids, I thought it would be this way. I've looked at other people and began to compare myself, and now I feel demoralized. Lord, be the glory and the lifter of my head. Sustain us through the night. Wake us in the morning. In Jesus' name, amen.